All right, I'll get us back on YouTube and we will start it from the top. All right, thank you. Do I need a, I don't need a call. The meeting to order again, right? Since it's already been called to order. Yeah. Yeah, I think I did. Those online, can you hear us? Yep. Okay. Yes. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. All right, Mayor, we are good to go. All right. So let's start roll call over again. Please. All right, Council Member Jessup. Present. Council Member Cleveland. Present. Council Member Espinosa. Present. There he is. <laughs> Council Member Peterson. He requested an absence. Excellent, thank you. Council Member Williams. Uh, it looks like she hasn't gotten back on. Um, Council Member Sherman. Present. And Council Member Boyle. Present. And let me buy her some time. Yeah, there she <laughs> is. And Council Member Williams. Present, sorry. Um, we do have a quorum. Excellent. Thank you so very much. Thanks for your patience, everyone. We appreciate it. All right. Will you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Okay, so it's time for public comment. Did anyone submit a request to do public comment uh, virtually? They did not, Mayor. Okay. Is there anyone in attendance who would like to speak at this time during public comment in, in council chambers? Please raise your hand. All right, seeing them, we're going to move on. Workshop topics. There's six of them on the agenda tonight. Um, first one is Mr. Rakai. Is that correct? Uh, he'll give a strategic plan up, update. Thank you, Zach. <laughs> Very good, Mayor. And uh, thank you, Madam Mayor and members of City Council. Uh, we're pulling up a quick presentation here. I'm Zach Rakai with Sageland Strategic. Um, I'll go into more in-depth interview uh, in, in a few slides, but um, strategic planning consultant for the city of College Place. Um, and uh, yeah, okay. Perfect. All right, we're working here. Um, so I wanted to welcome everyone to the first uh, workshop meeting where we're going to introduce um, why we are here, why we are updating the strategic plan, a little bit about uh, what is a strategic plan and what it means for the community and the region, but also talk a little bit about some of the engagement that we did um, prior to this meeting with uh, the surveys out to the community and staff. Um, and uh, uh, stakeholder interviews as well. And then do a little bit of primer for some visioning and creation of a new vision statement that we'll do in our next meeting as well. So um, really the general, the general purpose here for us meeting together and updating the strategic plan is really to create that vibrant future for College Place. 
Uh, we want to identify the major priorities and uh, specific goals for each priority and really embrace a chance to continue creating a long lasting legacy for the community. And obviously through my um, uh, engagement with the community, learning that uh, everyone, you know, College Place holds a special place in people's hearts and they want to preserve and sustain that community into the future. So a little bit about me, I'm Zach Rakai, um, Sage Land Strategic. We're a firm out of the Tri-Cities. Um, so somewhat regional to Southeast Washington. Um, I have over 22 years in local government, primarily working for cities in Colorado and Washington State in the world of uh, uh, land use planning, economic development, um, moving up into uh, executive administration, most recently with the city of Pasco. So I've been in Washington State since 2016 and uh, uh, never going to look back. Love this area and love Eastern Washington. Um, and uh, it was around that time, 2020, started doing some facilitations and strategic planning for uh, various communities around the country and uh, in our region as well, working in the Yakima Valley and here over in the Blue Mountain region too. So um, certified virtual facilitator, uh, collaborator. I love local government. I love meeting and learning about new communities and uh, still have my amateur hockey aspirations every Tuesday night back in uh, Kennewick. So um, still trying to hold on to that dream in my forties. Um, do have my family, wife and two kids, two dogs. Uh, we love just spending time on the lakes of the Northwest and, uh, and uh, going from there. So it's a pleasure working with your community and uh, being welcomed by the College Place community as well. So from a strategic planning standpoint, what are the fundamental questions that we want to answer with a strategic plan is really to assess through engagement, where are we now? So what's working well, what's not working well? Um, we will soon be identifying our vision and priorities, which is really, you know, where are we, where do we want to go in the next 10 years? As we update the 2017 strategic plan, you know, what does the next 10 years look like? A wildly successful college place, you know, what does it feel like to be in this community? And then from there, we'll identify our goals and objectives. So it's really, you know, how will we get there? What should we do? What could we do to achieve these goals and maintain this sense of community and college place? And then priorities and outcomes, implementation. Um, one part of this process is once the strategic plan is created by the city council, we'll be working with staff on an implementation plan and specific projects um, to know how will we know that we've gotten there? What metrics and measurements, what projects can we do for the community to make sure that we're meeting those priorities and goals? So strategic plan is not a master plan. Um, we you know, we always do a comprehensive land use plan. You do a capital improvement plan that gets very specific. But a strategic plan is a big picture view to guide the organization. It's a really a roadmap to achieve that vision for the future of College Place. It communicates to your community, to prospective staff members, to prospective businesses and industries coming in, what is most important to College Place in the community and why. And it's also a living document. I mean, how many of us in our professional circles have had a strategic plan that, you know, you get hired and we have a strategic plan for the organization, but it just kind of sits on the shelf. Um, we want to make sure that this is a document that is revisited quarterly, it is discussed, it's updated annually, and it's integrated to be flexible with the community. I mean, we've all been here, but who knows what happens to community government uh, during a global pandemic? You know, things get turned on its head. You can't be that rigid with your strategic plan. It has to flex, um, hopefully, as you achieve your goals, but also with changes in the community and growth in the community. So the purpose of the strategic plan is to obviously provide that direction based on a clear vision of the future. It helps guide and inform the budget. You outline your priorities and your goals, whether it's an economic development or infrastructure development. As you do your budget, the strategic plan can say, yeah, this was an identified goal of the city council and the community. So we need to really pay a lot of attention to this during the budgeting process. The strategic plan provides those actionable items that support the community. Those are your implementation steps and your projects that staff and leadership can help implement to achieve those goals. It gives a clear focused message, shows what's important to the community, what services and programs are, are prioritized by the community and by the city council. It's obviously an informational tool like we discussed. It's a tool that can help with budgeting and identifying short-term and long-term budgeting priorities, both for operations, capital improvements. 
and it's a marketing tool as well. Um, there's a lot of grant programs that ask, you know, what are your key priorities for the community? A strategic plan can certainly help boost and support grant applications. Um, it's great for uh, a prospective industry looking to locate a factory with 200 jobs in College Place. What are the key priorities and goals for the community? This is a community with a focus on the future. So what are the outcomes of this process? We talked about decision making. Uh, we talked about sustainable budgeting, determining what services are important to the community and the city council, um, providing that unified vision, but also it defines your partnerships. You know, one of your goals um, may, you know, talk about regional outreach to other agencies or other quasi-governmental agencies to nonprofits, public-private partnerships. Um, and it provides uh, greater ways and creative ways to help collaborate with your community and, and leverage some of those items that make College Place a beautiful and wonderful community. Any questions on strategic planning in a nutshell as a concept? Seeing some head nods. I did see a microphone go unmuted up on the Zoom. Councilmember Williams, did you have any questions or comments at this time? No, I just nothing's going on here, so I didn't pick it up. <laughs> All right. <know>. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. So we started this process a couple of months ago, and um, in working with uh, the scope of work for this project, we wanted to really target some engagement results of the community and dig deep. Whether it was a survey that anyone in the community could take. Um, and provide information, data, comments, um, but also targeted stakeholder outreach and interviews, engagement through that way. Confidential interviews where we're not going to attribute a comment specifically to, uh, you know, Joe Smith, but to really a way to have in-depth conversations on various aspects of the community and see what general priorities are in the community as well. Um, reports on the survey and the interviews were included with your council packets and staff report as well. So I'm just going to give a quick broad brush and stand for questions and feel free to stop me at any time as well. So we looked at the surveys. Um, we did do a Spanish language survey to the community that did receive zero responses. Um, we did have 55 responses to the community survey and 19 responses to the staff survey. Um, the data showed we asked if they were residents or business owners or property owners in the community. The vast majority were people that live as residents of College Place. Um, it was a good spread of longevity. I put that comment up there, but it was a good spread of people that were newcomers that have lived here for less than five years and people that have uh, a long tenured residency in, the, in College Place of 10, 20 years and beyond. Um, we had good responses. You, you tend to see... Um, age demographics come into play. Older generations tend to respond to these more, but we did receive a, a fair amount of good responses from a 35 plus age cohort. We did receive uh, a good level of responses from below that as well. In general, the community and the respondents to the survey felt that College Place was going in a pretty positive direction. Um, when they talked about the various aspects of College Place and the services that you provide that was most valued currently, you looked at fire, police, EMS, those emergency first responders, and the parks that were provided took like the top four slots of what's most valued. When we took that same list to ask, okay, what's what's lacking or where are there some opportunities for improvements? And excuse the typo on the slide, but um, you know, providing more recreation opportunities. You know, you may have a park, but can we provide more youth sports, uh, recreation opportunities, and senior programs? Were uh, some of the biggest responses there. In general, and this was a strength that I saw throughout all of my conversations, through all the engagement, but. Strengths of the community, it's safe, it's friendly, there's a small town feel. It feels like a community. It's growing, it's part of a bigger region, um, but it's safe. In general, the responses to the question, do you feel that the college place, city, government is um, prepared to face challenges? Ooh, I'm hitting some of the questions here, sorry. Or hitting some of the, uh, um, anyways, the community felt that you were generally prepared to face uh, challenges ahead in the region. We talked a little bit about what those challenges, what those barriers to success might be. And, uh, you know, a lot of the talk on, is there gonna be enough commercial tax revenue coming in to pay for city services? 
um, are you going to be able to ass sustain essential services to the community? Um, there were some comments about customer service through utility billing at the, at the city, but that might be um, uh, somewhat of isolated incidents. Um, but then land ownership impacting business growth. You know, the university owns a lot of property in the community. Uh, does that impact growth in business, residential, uh, that sort of thing? And then, of course, what's facing city governments and county governments, public sector all throughout the country is unfunded mandates coming down that impact operations, that impact staffing levels, um, even regulatory environments for things like wastewater treatment, things like that. I had one chance. Oh, okay, here we go. Um, some of the trends that people in the community saw that College Place should be mindful of is obviously, you know, there's a strong sense of community here. Um, and they want to continue that, continue that this is a strong, tight knit community. Um, leadership in the council and staff leadership was a huge benefit of what's working well. And that is something that they want to sustain in the future. Um, Additional recreational facilities and looking at, you know, trends and what's popular in recreation and what people are going to want. Um, you know, I think when I worked over in Tri-Cities for, uh, you know, City of Pasco, was, no one's playing regular tennis anymore, but everyone's playing pickleball. So, you know, those kind of things. What activities are going to be beneficial? And obviously continued support for your police and um, fire departments, your first responders, uh, providing those services directly in the community. Now we talk about what we want to preserve no matter what as a driver to a future vision. You know, the small town feel, the safe community, the tight knit community, um, continued infrastructure improvements, you know, building those sidewalks in neighborhoods that didn't have sidewalks before, continually looking at the streets and utilities and planning for the growth. Um, that sense of pride and safety. You know, College Place knows that we're, we're the, the community knows that you're growing, that there's opportunities, that the, the, this is a desired place in the Pacific Northwest to live. Um, but it's also a safe place. You know, kids can walk down the street. Uh, they want to continue that and preserve that for the future. And then support for kids, you know, youth recreation programs, but also support for um, the schools in the community, the, the school district, and make sure that we're providing places for the kids to not only uh, play and grow, but also to learn as well. Any questions on the surveys? Yes, Council, Council Member Jessup. Thank you. Uh, first of all, kudos to staff because we're already covering half the concerns or more and an improvement. So already seen around the corner. Um, with 55 respondents in your experience out of well, 10,000 residents, do you feel that that's about on par to get a true feel of the community. So 55 out of 10,000, mm -hmm. I don't know what that is for you in terms of what's your threshold of saying, all right, we, this is a good number. Sure. I think uh, to, to have something that's truly st statistically significant, you know, it'd have to be a lot more involvement there. But in looking at the results, looking at the commonality of the results that came through, 55 would be a pretty decent sample size for what we want to do here. Um, so you didn't see a lot of widespread differentiated answers. There was a lot of commonalities in the priorities, trends, that sort of thing. So that's what we look at here. And then that's a pretty good percentage for a, a community like this. Okay. So going more in depth, um, working with city staff and leadership, we identified a list of uh, a, a number of stakeholders in the community um, these can be people that were elected to, uh, you know, county office, to um, business owners, educational leaders, uh, boards and commission members to have more of an in-depth interview. We did over 20 of these, which um, allows us to take an hour, half hour to ask similar questions that you would have on the survey, but be able to have some point counterpoint and dig deeper. And what, what do you mean by this? What do you can you expand on that? Um, like I said, they were confidential, so we tried to get an air of, you know, the answers that you provide, good or bad, are not, you know, going to be uh, held out to be as candid as possible. Um, and then, obviously, we, you know, the point of this and the interviews is just to gather that additional information and identify some of the common themes and priorities. So some of the key themes that we saw here, what's working well, a lot of respondents talked about council and city leadership that, um, you know, it's very strong city leadership, very favorable. Um, 
looking at you know maintaining that into the future. Uh, key themes of what's working well was some managed community growth, not necessarily opening the doors to anyone that would want to come in, but targeted to get new businesses, sales tax generators, um, as well as placement of homes, um, very strategic. Um, accessibility and inclusiveness. So this kind of took an infrastructure, but also a thematic viewpoint as well. Um, accessibility and providing those sidewalks in areas that were not, um, did not have sidewalks, residential areas before, making sure that the infrastructure is accessible to all more, all modes of transportation, but inclusiveness and in providing additional community events that go beyond what Walla Walla might do for the region and uh, making those accessible and available to everyone in the community and welcoming everyone in the community as well. Um, effective community engagement. This was seen as an improvement. Um, the city listens, the community listens when people in the community raise a concern and positive community image. So, you know, having those additional community events in the last number of years has said, hey, I'm a college place. You know, I'm going to the Christmas parade. I'm going to Fourth of July. I'm going to all this. This is my town and this is what this is where I live and this is my community event. Um, leads to a very positive community image. We did ask a question, are there negative perceptions of the community? And a lot of the respondents are, I don't really see a whole heck of a lot there. So that was pretty good. We tried to frame the negative question as positively as possible. So what are the opportunities for improvement? Um, so we did talk about, you know, community involvement and that there's additional community engagement, but providing those opportunities and getting the younger population, younger generations to volunteer for boards and commissions and help on community events, which is a trend we see nationwide. Um, communication we talked about was improved over the last number of years, but could be better. You know, I know um, staff is kind of doubling in that communication role as well, but could could there be a more targeted approach and additional resources provided for that? Um, having a vibrant downtown. Oh, go ahead. Or oh, I thought you were. Oh, you're just raising your water. Okay, I thought you were raising your hand. <laughs> Cheers. Okay. Um, so having a vibrant downtown, working on College Avenue, having some uh, gathering spaces there, uh, new businesses, um, understanding that uh, some of the businesses may not be open on the weekends, but having more businesses in downtown for you know get a cup of coffee or uh, a meal open all seven days. Um, staff and resources, we hear that everywhere, but here in particular, do we have enough staff and resources to serve our growing community? And uh, is that a concern that we need to bring into this process? And then a distinct community identity. As College Place grows, as community events grow, and the pride in the community grows, um, you know, have that separate we're College Place being well known around the region, not just necessarily like, oh, it's just south of Walla Walla. Um, so how how can you improve that identity just, excuse me, just for College Place? Um, kind of distilling all of that information down into 10 priorities, and uh, this will be sort of a framework that we'll take to the October 1st meeting. Uh, but some of the priorities for the future that were identified are affordable and attainable housing. So the identified need for affordable housing as it meets from that governmental de def definition, but also attainable housing. Can someone that recently graduated college and has a job here afford a house, be able to raise their family here? Um, economic development, which can mean anything from small business support to the attraction of new industry and jobs to uh, large scale retail. Public safety is always a priority, maintaining that we're able to respond to fire and police calls, EMS. Um, facilities improvements, you know, um, whether it's a, a public works facility, are you building enough fire stations, are your parks in good order? Uh, we know Lions Park is undergoing a significant uh, improvement effort now, but how does that continue up to facilities that the city can have to serve the community? Well-planned growth was another priority. Are you growing enough for your, uh, you know, to accommodate an influx of new residents, but are you growing enough in your business? Are you growing enough and planning your utilities and your infrastructure out to serve that? Tying into infrastructure improvements, continue with the accessibility, the sidewalk um, placement, but also looking at infrastructure as a whole, being uh, looking at it as the big picture. Are you providing infrastructure to serve new growth, but are you also able to provide it in a way that is sustainable for um, the city to, to maintain and, and continue to put in good shape. Uh, 
Regional collaboration, so um, collaboration with Walla Walla County, surrounding communities, um, other quasi public agencies to make sure that, you know, the region is on the same page, particularly if, as you look to regional growth. Um, parks and community space, you know, providing new parks, but also community space. Are there recreational amenities, a community center, those sorts of things to plan for in the future? Bike and pedestrian infrastructure, we talk about sidewalks, pedestrian infrastructure accessibility, um, tying into the bike trails of the region, tying into, you know, some tourism aspects. Um, are you building complete streets? Uh, that sort of thing for that would accommodate bicycle lanes um, and, and all that. And then obviously recreation opportunities. Being in the Blue Mountain region, this part of the state, are you um, harnessing some of those regional recreation opportunities, but are you able to provide those programs within the city limits as well to uh, tie into senior programs, youth sports, and other activities as well? And then finally, we asked the question, what does a wildly successful college place look like to you? And it tied around, you know, five key themes that we can talk about tonight is, you know, a successful college place. Um, it's going to have affordable housing workforce and housing sustainability, um, affordable housing that supports population growth at all demographic levels, housing to support a workforce at all wages. So um, retail workforce all the way to professional workforce and support for a diverse and growing population that uh, we're seeing in this valley come in. Managed growth and identity protection. Um, Identity protection sounds a little too serious, um, but you know, planned growth. Are you preserving college places' uh, identity that of a small, tight knit, safe, family oriented community? Um, are you adapting to evolving demographics? Um, you know, whether it's uh, uh, racial or age, younger populations, um, that sort of thing, and thoughtfully managing your growth to embrace broad community values. Um, making sure that you're uh, inclusive of everybody. Economic and business development. Um, so a wildly successful college place would see diverse business opportunities thriving and flourishing. Um, tourism driven economic growth uh, through local attractions. So the wine industry was talked about pretty significantly. How can college place leverage that as part of a tourism drive? Um, and a vibrant self-sufficient downtown, you know, um, development along College Avenue and uh, finding that central business district for community gathering. Leadership and community engagement. A wildly successful college place is going to have uh, maintain its strong city leadership, um, continue and grow its community programs to foster a sense of pride, um, and have an engaged and informed community. They're, they're engaged and informed at what's going on at City Hall, what's going on regionally. Um, they're able to come in and provide comments, serve on boards and commissions, volunteer for events. Finally, infrastructure and recreation. So enhanced walkability, bikeability, um, you know, all the gamuts of infrastructure for all residents. Develop and continue to maintain your roadways and your utilities and developing new recreational facilities. So any questions on the uh, surveys, interviews, engagement, any of the data? A lot of information put out there. I know there was a couple pages in your staff reports as well. So we want to talk um, about this process. Member Williams? Yes. Um, you, it talk, people talked about better communication. Did they give any specifics on how that could happen? Um, I'd have to go back through the notes because there was an abundance of materials. I, I can't recall off the top of my head if there was a specific, you know, like, oh, do a call, do a newsletter, get more outreach on social media. Um, but we can certainly find that information and provide that to council. I can enlighten on that. If at least I remember what I what I said, if you if council wants to hear that, uh, Mayor. Please do. OK, so my um, what I this is through observation as well as my own work at City Hall is um, we answer a lot of questions. We point people in a lot of directions. We we do that repeatedly and it takes up a lot of staff time. I think if we had some um, easier ways to communicate um, with the public um, on routine questions we get, whether it's just updating the website or if we have a person that we could 
turn them to to talk to versus um, okay, now you're going to talk to the city attorney or you're going to talk to the director of public works when when it would be more efficient if we could get that line of communication going and people know where to go, if that makes sense. Did that, that make sense? sense? And the fact that we got 55 people doing the survey, um, and I have to admit the survey never made it into my face, but my face has been pretty much dissertation and nothing else so but the, you know a lot of our traditional ways of reaching out to people aren't don't seem to be actually connecting with people and so um finding out what they want um would be really really helpful i have that down so no I have another comment along those lines. I think that, um, you know, from a number perspective, I think the number is low for the amount of citizens that we have. And maybe it opens up an opportunity to engage our high schools or universities uh, and the appropriate classes as outreach programs for them to be uh, representatives, if you will, of the community to go out and proactively reach out to people at community events maybe door to door, going to those different represented neighborhoods within our community so that we can get um, a wider uh, data data points that we can have on, on the survey. So just the involvement of, of our schools and universities, I think would be um, a good use of the resources uh, to, to gather more information. Duly noted. Um, so next, as we go down this process and we'll talk about what the future meetings will hold with this, um, we do have a thought on the vision statement and uh, the vision statement that was created in 2017 and um, how we can improve that, shorten it, make it a little bit more targeted. Like we said, with the previous strategic plan that was done prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the landscape and the makeup of College Place and just local government in general has changed since then as well. Um, so I'll be providing a handout to the clerk to pass out to the uh, council and um, some food for thought, maybe a little bit of homework prior to our October 1st meeting. Um, but as we look towards a vision statement, as we look towards what that means, what we need to do to create a new vision for College Place, Vision statement is your definition for the future. It takes place in the future. It's it's not a in the future we will be. It is something that, you know, you state it as something that has happened already. You know, college place is. Um, you make it as sort of a final statement. It has to be aspirational. Um, it takes in the big picture, but it also should inspire action and involvement from your community. So what makes a good vision statement? This is all in your homework as well. Um, it's clear and simple. It's future based. It's very easy to explain. You want to be able to say that if you're running into someone at a community event. Um, it's not necessarily the purpose of your organization that gets into the mission statement, which we'll work on as well. But it answers that question that we had asked during our engagement is what does a successful college place look like? And you talk about it as an is statement, not a going to be statement. And obviously make it compelling as well. So I will pass that on um, to the clerk here. So our next step in this process, um, and I will talk to Mike as well about outreach and surveys um, based upon council comments this evening, but October 1st, coming back for that workshop um, to discuss mission and vision hash out at least some words that we need to do, maybe a proposed mission and vision for council to consider, and then determination of those priorities. Want to identify five to seven priority areas that could be combined or all encompassing. So have that discussion, maybe a little bit of a vote, get you out of your chairs um, to hang a dot on something there. I love a good dot vote. Um, after that, using those priorities, uh, going through a goal setting exercise, either in a later meeting in October or early November, and then if timing goes based upon the current scope of work, um, a review of the plan at the November 12th city council meeting. 
After council signs off and approves that, then I'll work with city leadership and staff on the implementation and action plan, which could get down as detailed as the next 30 days, staff will do this to enact action on this goal. 30, 60, 90, 180 day projects, um, everything that's within the current capacity that can go to moving forward on those goals as well. So I wanna say thank you for having me in your community. It's been great. Um, it's been great sharing this information. Um, I can stand for a couple other questions or comments at this time and uh, looking forward to working with you as we continue through the fall. Thank you so much. We appreciate all that work and all that information. You bet. Um, I know we kind of have you hustling through it. So <laughs> thank you for working with us that way. I'm going to go through council members for any questions or comments, but I'm going to start on this end with council member Boyle. I'm sorry. Next time I won't give you a heads up. I actually don't have any questions, though. This was all a lot. Um, I think most of it's really, really good. It's really helpful as we look at the project of, you know, continuing our strategic planning and stuff. So and these pieces with your suggestions is really helpful. So Perfect. thank you. Councilmember Sherman. No, I don't want to ask questions because it's Tuesday and he needs to get to hockey. Oh, I, I'm, I'm taking You're the, the session off. Just, yes. Uh, but I don't. Um, I I was here for the the last process, which was really good, and lots of sticky notes and all all of that. So I'm excited to go through it again. So thank you very much. Awesome. Right. Councilmember yeah. Williams. I I have a couple of comments. Um, one is a number of us are going to have to be coming in by Zoom, um, for various reasons. So. The good old fashioned post it notes on the walls aren't going to work that well. So I'm hoping that we can come up. I know there's um, ways to do that electronically. So I'm hoping that we can keep that in mind. And then, second, um, just to let you know kind of where I'm coming from, I don't mind tweaking the vision a little bit, but I always feel like a vision is a really long term thing. And so I, when we talk about a new vision, every time we do a strategic new strategic plan, that makes me a little uncomfortable. So this will be one time in my life that I'm conservative, wanting to keep things the same. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for the input. And uh, we will have an inclusive process for hybrid meetings. Um, if we need to go to vote, we need to provide that additional information, that sort of thing. So. I think, uh, Council Member Williams, one of the thoughts was so much has changed since the last one was done. Uh, possibilities, uh, ideas, um, even things that we did not know could ever be done here. Um, we weren't, you know, the vision wasn't big enough. So I, I think that's kind of one of the reasons we want to re relook at it. Oh, Mike? Also, and I don't mind looking at it. Oh. I just <laughs> also I would just say that one thing where uh my opinion as far as where vision statement could be tweaked a little bit is typically it's supposed to be like a elevator pitch, it's so very brief. And when you try that with the existing one, it tends to be it doesn't fit the elevator criteria. So uh brevity is probably in order. <laughs> That's yeah. right. I remember that now. We have a, yeah, we have an escalator speech right now. <laughs> I like that. Councilmember Espinosa. Um, yeah, just a comment. Um, I can't help but but just be puzzled at the level of engagement that our community exhibits sometimes, uh, especially around filling out these surveys, because this work is really important and is going to impact the direction of our city and the long run. So um, just thinking of ways in which we could make people aware of the discussions that we're having and the impact of, of, of their participation or lack thereof uh, could have in the city, um, I think would be something uh, very helpful um, in the future. And then uh, the, quality of the, the quality of the data I think is good like the five common themes that were identified among the uh, the 55 respondents, I think 
if more people were to fill those out, probably they would echo the same sentiment of those 55. Uh, so I think the quality is, is very good and it could be a very actual representation of how people feel um, and, and where we need to be headed um, as far as our community in the next few years. I was thinking about what you said a little bit earlier, Council Member Espinosa, and I was thinking about how potentially in the future, uh, all of us could take something like this and share it with our contacts, our, you know, our neighbors, our family members, um, our church families, and encourage them to participate in this type of um, information for our city. Um, I think that would probably be a, a great way of doing it other than putting it, you know, we put it in our newsletters, we put it on social media, which are various platforms. We have them here in the lobby, um, you know, so, but I think the best way is in person and probably the strongest would be um, starting here with those of us that sit behind this, this table, at this table. Yeah. Um, yeah. Ms. Colwell, I think I saw your hand up. I was just going to say perhaps a um, contest between council members to see how many um, uh, engagement surveys they can get from their constituents. So just all right. thought. She threw a, a little extra challenge into the pool there. All right. And, and just a follow up comment, Mayor, uh, that I'd like to make along the lines of my comment is uh, the Hispanic community, they filled zero surveys. So we need to find a way to reach them, maybe in their language, maybe to have a unique approach or, or other communities, other ethnic groups within our community so that we can also give them a voice. Um, I think it'd be really important to, to make an effort to, uh, to take them into account when we're having these discussions. Yes, absolutely. We're trying to think of ways to engage um, our Spanish speaking community more here um, within the, the city to see if we can get that. But thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Cleveland. No questions. Thanks. Okay. Council Member Jessup. Well, uh, comment and question. Um, I think Council Member Williams and I both taught through COVID. So there's a thousand and ones how to teach on Zoom. <laughs> oh my yeah. gosh. Uh, yeah, I just want to make sure I say kudos to the city and staff because even in the areas of growth, there's already currently plans in place to even address the concerns or areas of growth. So again, it's kudos to the staff and the council. We're, we're kind of, you get, we, you guys are already on the ball. Um, also, just a, a continued encouragement with some of the council members. Um, uh, concerns that I also agree with. Uh, kudos to the staff even last year as a government teacher at the local high school already working together to reach out to the families and students early on at that local high school. Uh, we've seen some small successes, but I hope to encourage to continue that. Um, this is my last question. And I promise I'll be done. Um, you know, don't mind being trendsetters in a positive way, which is awesome. But um, when it comes to our survey results, where do you see us and other cities and towns in which you've worked with in terms of uh, you guys are unique in this way. You're trend setting, you're doing great here. Uh, we're seeing you as a more of the upper end of the bell curve. Mm -hmm. uh, or, and, or where are the, some of the areas who are like, well, uh, this is definitely a concern and area of growth, but this is also area of growth we're seeing in all communities. Yeah, I appreciate that question. And honestly, the, the the thing that set College Place apart over the last couple of years working with communities around the country is just how positive they were towards the community image. Um, I recently worked with a community elsewhere in Washington State that had a very negative community image. So just to kind of come over here and engage with the residents and stakeholders and everything that, oh my gosh, we, you know, we love it here. We moved here from such and such area, or I'm a lifelong resident, I never want to leave, that's been, that's set you apart. And I think the other aspect of that too was just not, you know, other negative perceptions for College Place and not getting a lot of answers there and asking that question of what can the community leverage? What are the opportunities for improvement? And hearing, oh, I'm not, I'm not thinking, nothing really comes to mind, maybe later in the conversation. I think that was definitely the differentiation here. So, yeah. That's great to hear. Mm -hmm. Good question. All right. Any other questions or comments? 
Thank you. We'll Thank see you all you soon. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Safe drive back home. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Next on our agenda, Ms. Colwell is going to present on the Pacific Corp uh, doing business as Pacific Power and Light. Um, yes, and I apologize that should the uh, subject should have include included franchise agreement. So 20 years ago, the city granted a franchise agreement to um, Pacific Port to provide electrical power to um, customers within the city of College Place. And so that was a 20 year franchise. So we're up for um, they've applied to renew that franchise. And uh, the city has that authority under state law. We also have a code section that governs all franchises for utilities and telecommunication companies. Um, you may recall that we um, uh, city council granted a franchise to a couple irrigation districts recently, and then also to Zipley um, fiber optic um, uh, providing that fiber optics services within the city. And uh, generally speaking, these franchise agreements have to um, have substanti substantially similar terms um, so that uh, not one uh, utility provider can have a monopoly or the city doesn't favor one over the other. So what I've provided to city council is really the first draft. It's kind of a working template that I began when I first started with the city and we've updated and revised as we've um, issued these new franchise agreements. Um, I have the, the agreement that's before you, there's a couple of changes that I've gone back through and made. Section 20 doesn't apply, so that's been pulled out. Um, section 25, I've added some additional language in regards to um, construction and reconstruction to help deal with um, the issue that we're dealing with Pacific Core right now. Um, it needs to be reviewed by the public works director, uh, Mike um, Holden and I, our capital facilities manager, will go over it with a fine tooth comb and make sure that all of the city interests are protected. So this is just an opportunity for uh, council members to ask any questions, become familiar with the document, we'll be coming forward in the next um, few council meetings for action. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm sure I will get a question about what's going on with the old polls. So I'm happy to give that update if um, the mayor um, or any council members have a question about that. Might as well give it now. Okay, I'll give it now. Um, we've had a couple polls removed, um, which is good news. Um, just today, um, we responded to their response to our initial letter saying, you guys need to fix this. You're not in compliance with your franchise. You're not in compliance with the code and you're not in compliance with the permits that we issued for you to do this project. And that's when we got the presentation um, by Pacific Corp. So we responded to that letter and um, I was able to uh, sit down with Mike Holden and we went through the process and Pacific uh, Pacific. I'll just say Pacific Power, it's easier to say. Pacific Power, um, they were on notice December 23rd, 2024, when their um, contractor notified them of every poll that was in College Place that had third-party um, equipment on it were being used by third parties that needed to be notified, needed to get the ball rolling to get that moved over so that they could take the old polls down. So that was de December 23rd. Basically, the letter just says, what you're trying to tell us is not sufficient. Um, it's it's you still need to basically do what we asked you to do in the beginning and do it quickly. We've asked them to now provide the city with daily updates of what they're doing to remedy the issue. But we are seeing small movements and uh, but we want to stay on top of it because I anticipate that if we don't hold their feet to the fire, it might just go by the wayside. So that's where we are now. All right, thank you. All right, questions or comments from any member of the council? I'm not gonna go through everybody. I have a question, uh, Mayor, okay. for Ms. Colwell. 
Um, Ms. Colwa, so, so how does this agreement um, make modifications to prevent what's happening now from occurring in the future from a legal standpoint? Well, um, what my suggestion is going to be is that if we, I think we should address poll removal specifically within the franchise agreement. Um, I want to get the buy-in from Mike Holden on that, um, but I'd also like to just be inclusive that, look, if you have, what I would like to put in there is if you have, and it's not in there now, if you have a project that the city deems is a major project, we could call it something else, but let's call it a major project, you're going to enter into a separate agreement with us and it's going to set out the timelines, the expectations, um, the ramifications if you don't follow that timeline and those expectations and just add that requirement in. I think if if it, whether it be monetary penalties or I, I really that's probably what will work is monetary penalties, something that, um, you know, right now we're not going to have a carrot. The carrot is they get to operate in our community and make money. Uh, we need a stick. And I think that would be appropriate for council to consider. Okay. Thank you very much. Councilmember Williams. Uh, my question is along the same lines as Councilmember Espinoza, but to go one step further, we also grant the franchises to these third parties, don't we? We do grant to these third parties. And what we require of the third parties is that they have to show that they have the authority to be on someone else's property and operate on someone else's property. So when we grant to, let's say, Lumen, right, to use Pacific Power Pole, um, they have to show that they have the authority to operate on that. That's all that they have to show. So we could, if we were to grant, um, we could beef up that language saying, you know, if you have the authority, uh, if you, have, you show us the authority to use someone else's equipment, um, and if that someone else tells you to do something under your under your agreement with them, you have to do it. And if you don't do it, you're in violation of our franchise. I think that would be helpful. What I'm wary of is if we do that, are now the city staff going to be spending significant amount of time doing the work that Pacific Power should be doing? So I think there's a balance there that we need to, to have to hold that the feet to the fire of both of those parties. Yeah, I um I agree. I think the pole owner should be the one that has to do all the running around after people. Mm -hmm. But I think it would be helpful to have it be really clear in the secondary franchisees agreement that you will be responsible for doing work like moving to other poles and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a great great suggestion and i will make note of that as we move forward because more of these i imagine will come due thank you thank you any other questions or comments council member cleveland i skimmed through the uh, franchise agreement and i noticed under section 2a uh, third line, operating, maintaining, repairing, and removing facilities necessary to provide water utility services. I'm presuming that would be electric. Yes, that's correct. This came from, okay. I believe, an irrigation district that I revised, okay. saved, and they're like, er, back up. So, yes. So just, it will just go so we probably want to update that unless they want to yes. start, you know, installing hydroelectric generators in every home instead of just running the power yes. lines. I, I thank you for catching that. No problem. Councilmember Jessup. This is kind of a funny question in light of the current conversation. It's not pointed at all. It's just truly, truly wondering how this process works. Um, when you're doing franchises and awarding franchises, does it work in the same process as you, when we grant uh, contracts, meaning we have bidders and we do the whole thing or whatnot? I, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, I'm ignorant on the process. Forgive me. No, that's fine. Nope. It, it it's a separate process than doing something like this. This isn't um this isn't a city project or a city facility where we would have to go through the bidding law bidding laws. But if another power company came in and said, "Hey, we want to 
we want to provide power to, that would be council would consider that and say, hey, wouldn't it be great if we had two power providers? They'd be more competitive, maybe less cost to the city. And we can let another power company use our right away if we want to. Thank you. <laughs> Anything else? All right. Thank you, Ms. Cola. We appreciate that. You're welcome. And I'm a little jealous of seeing that light come in your window back there. It's wonderful. Uh, I wish I could tame my hair, but you know, <laughs> I might have to get Councilor Mem Council Member Williams' hairdo. There you go. It's pretty comfortable sometimes. I recommend it. <laughs> right? I know. All right, so let's go. We're going to move on. And now uh, Mr. Carlton is going to pretend, present on Government Finance 101. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I've provided this um, little Finance 101 uh, session before. Uh, we thought it was appropriate to uh, review this again as we get into the budgeting uh, process for 2025. Now, I'll cover these four topics. We'll try to go over them briefly so we don't keep you here until like eight or nine, you know, so yeah. uh, we'll talk about uh, general accepted accounting principles, what basis of accounting uh, that we use and are available for cities. Uh, we'll talk about fund accounting and then go over briefly the budgeting process. Now, some well, I'll just I won't go through every single point in every slide. I'll talk briefly about uh, each slide. This is where the government and, and uh, private sector businesses uh, come into play, and the differences. Basically, at our government level, we are driven from fund accounting, and uh, we are required by RCW to um, operate under a balanced budget process. Therefore. It, revenues equal expenditures. And since we are cash basis, um, I'll get into that detail in the next couple of slides. But you know we don't have a mo we don't have a profit motive. Uh, really, our resources are driven by budgets. and um, we basically provide uh, services, some of which are not at a fee uh, that we charge uh, fire and um, police. Uh, no fee for service, but we do have our utilities, which we charge uh, fees like a normal profit business, although we don't. Um, we have a fund balance at the end of the year, but not really a profit. Um, and also, we do not pay uh, most uh, federal income taxes. So the uh, final, the government financial statements, uh, these are the users that we typically deal with, uh, taxpayers, citizens, creditors, legislative bodies, granters, management, and rating agencies like Moody's and S&P. Um, so general accepted accounting principles are what established by the accounting community within within the US and, and internationally. And we are supposed to report based on generally accepted accounting principles, when to recognize revenue, uh, when to recognize expenses. Uh, we, we do um, not comply completely with uh, generally accepted accounting principles in that we operate under uh, cash basis, which um, as I said, well, I'll get into that slide and it'll, it'll come up a little bit later. Um, so the basis of accounting, there's basically two general ones. So one is cash, which we operate on, which means we only recognize revenue when we put the cash in the bank and we only recognize expenditures when the cash goes out of the bank. So no accruals, no accounting for uh, depreciable assets, uh, no liabilities recognized. Um, so that's basically the cash basis. Accrual is when you recognize your revenues when the, um, the receipt of the funds is anticipated. So if we build our customers on the 25th of the month, we would recognize that revenue on the 25th of the month. Under cash basis, we only recognize that revenue and we get the cash from them. 
what this really does is it's a lot simpler for um, small communities to operate under a cash basis because it's easy to easy to understand. You don't have to understand all the rules when it comes with liabilities and fixed assets, and it's just an approach that the state chose to use, and it is the only state in uh, the United States that allows for cash basis accounting. A um, couple of the other types of modi a modified accrual, which means you you're basically cash, but you recognize some of the revenues when they're recognized and not received, and same with expenditures. Uh, and then there's uh, uh, a method called budgetary basis of accounting. Um, some of the advantages and disadvantages we've already spoke of. Uh, some of the advantages are it's easy to understand and use because you know that you're recording stuff when you pay probably a lot like your personal uh, um, finances. You know, you only recognize stuff when you pay it or when you get the cash in. Um, it makes cash flow easy to understand. Um, the financial reporting is aligned with budgets and financial reporting may be less costly because you're not uh, reconciling a whole bunch of balance sheet accounts and extra time in the finance area. Disadvantages is it's very short-term uh, perspective, whereas accrual base is more long-term where you record your fixed assets and you depreciate them over the useful life. We don't have that feature in cash basis accounting. So a little less information on where you're at on net book value on what your city's worth or when you're recognizing liabilities as far as um, debt you owe um, are not shown on a cash basis. Uh, a few exceptions to that and that the state in its wisdom has when I supply the year and information, I do have to provide them a uh, a few statements that are typically accrual, uh, how much debt we have, and a few other ones they require us to give them that information. So in Washington State, uh, we operate under the BARS accounting and reporting system where they dictate uh, the structure of the accounting and what codes we have to use so it's standard across uh, the state. Uh, so in government accounting, we use a thing called fund accounting, which tracks uh, different components of your general ledger according to different groupings of costs. If we have our general fund, which takes care of all of our uh, police, fire, administration, uh, and then you have your utilities that operate under a se uh, separate set of funds. Then you have certain... Uh, Capital accounts you have to keep separate in a fund. There's certain um, fiduciary uh, things where you it's not your money, but you're basically a fiduciary for other money that's given by the employees or the, the citizens. Um, so right now we have, uh, so here's the different fund types, the governmental funds, which are, you know, the ones to operate the, uh, general city, including police and fire. You have pri proprietary funds, which operate like a business, which are utilities. And then you have fiduciary funds where you are basically holding money for some other purpose. And those all have to be restricted and there's requirements of what fund you use under what scenario. <clears throat> so when we created the uh, TIF district uh, last year, we required, it, we required a new fund for that. Um, if there's any debt service that we require under any scenario, some of them will require a new fund, like our TIF uh, bond ordinance. That will require a, both a new fund to track the monies in there, and we will also be required to have a new bank account to be able to track everything separately. So here's the list. I think there's 37 funds we have now. There's a couple in addition to that. You can see in the upper left how it's identified as what component of the fund accounting it is. And you can see our governmental includes our current expense, our 
um, expense reserve fund, the technology fund, and the, um, can't even read the last one, it's too small. <laughs> Employee benefits reserve fund, thank you. And then there's special revenue funds, some debt service, some capital, uh, proprietary funds there you can see are all the utilities and our internal service uh, fund, which is our shop. And then we have a fiduciary fund where we track in a uh, flexible benefit fund for the employees. Brian, I have a question. I know that we've asked this before, mm -hmm. but we talk about these funds, but how many actual like bank accounts do we have? Because uh, that's not the same. No, there's not a bank account associated with each of these funds. We have about eight bank accounts. Okay. Some of those are uh, required by uh, funding arrangements that so we have mm -hmm. a separate bank account for capital projects. Um, basically, we have one main general account, which our deposits and disbursements go through. And then we have a few sweep accounts and a, a couple uh, investment accounts, which are included in there. So all in all, I think there's about eight okay. accounts. So most of our funds flow through one account. It's because of regulatory requirements, we have to hold some of these other accounts. Um, so our reserves, uh, as you know, when we go through the budget, we make sure that we are in compliance with our reserves, which are approved by council and tell us how much we have to keep in certain um, funds as a minimum amount. So we have um, unreserved fund balances. Uh, we have a policy of unreserved fund balances with all operating funds in a reasonable amount of emergency of for or unseen needs. And that's 17% um, of the budgeted revenues, excluding transfers and internal loan balances. And our main, that is associated basically with our current expense, uh, which is our fund with the most activity. Then we have some debt service funds. And our target there is to have one year of annual debt service in reserve. We have our facilities capital reserve in which um, we want to keep that fund balance at a dollar amount of 300,000 in order to fund projects uh, moving forward. And then we have our rainy day fund, which is 005, which was established by council about five, six years ago. And we are continuing to put money in there. Our goal is to have 10% of the current expense fund balance in the reserve. And uh, due to financial reasons, the last couple of years, we have not been building that reserve, but it is there. And I think it's about close to 400,000 in there. And any payments out of that uh, fund have to be approved by council. Okay, into our budget process. Of course, this happens every year. Um, and we start out um, at the very basic level of information, and we basically do a zero-based budget, which we look at each year separately and determine what the costs are by line item. Each management department manager goes through their areas, and they put in their initial projections of expenditures, not including payroll. Payroll becomes directly imported from the payroll system. So all they're looking at is basically their operating and capital expenditures for the year. Um, so why we have a budget? Well, budget plays an important role for the organization. And for example, budgets are used in the managing of operations, government agencies, churches, hospitals, small businesses, manufacturing. Um, the expenditure levels in the budget are called appropriations and they re represent spending limits. So when we do purchase requisitions within any of the departments, uh, if they are over their budget, they'll get a warning sign about um, that they're going over budget on that line item. But what we do as a city 
is we look at our budget as um, fund whole. So if the entire fund is within the reserve requirements, then you're in good shape. So if you're over and under on certain line items, it's not too concerning if we're in budget in total. So quite often in the variance reports, you'll see negative uh, budget amounts. We do look at those to consider if it was a one-time occurrence or a reoccurring occurrence that we have to do a budget amendment for. Well, we don't look at every single line item and say, oh, you're over $10, so you know we're going to cut your budget. We look at it in total for that fund. Are you within requirements? And we'll look at exceptions that something that's that's way out of line. So we'll look at that. And when it gets to be um, large enough, I'll talk with uh, Mike and we'll determine if a uh, budget amendment is um, necessary. And we did two of those last year. That basically takes into account uh, stuff that wasn't anticipated when we did the budget, new projects, um, maybe new hires, uh, whatever comes through, they can't wait till the next, bu next budget cycle. So our city budget process, we went through the schedule uh, a couple weeks ago, just in general, we're, it says March to August, but I don't think we've ever started the process in March, but uh, we're getting going now. It says September, um, September 12th is when the budget request to all departments has to be in. Uh, this is approximate dates because I think these are actual dates from a couple of years ago. Um, and then later part of September, we'll review those edge estimates. And then um, at the end of September, we'll provide the first version of the uh, budget estimates um, to council. And then it just goes on complete through the various uh, stages of the budget process, ultimately uh, um, having our final budget hearing in the middle, in the beginning of December. And then I think it's December 12th is the date we will be looking at uh, approval from council. So within that time frame, we'll bring a, a couple of versions of the budget to council, at least probably three before the final, and then um, go from there. And uh, financial transparency, important for us in accounting. We have our mon monthly financial reporting. Um, I know we were behind uh, last year and into this year because of our implementation of Tyler, which is now working, um, I think, I like it. There's some different opinions from people that work with different components of it, but it's uh, more substantial than uh, Springbrook gives us more reporting ability and a little bit, um, a lot more features in it. Um, we have our financial policy, which is updated uh, occasionally, and we do comprehensive annual fin uh, financial reports that are published with um, SAO office. We have our adopted annual budgets that we also provide debt information and all our information is available on the city website. It was quick, I think, but questions. All right, yeah, it was quick considering um, <laughs> stuff that you have to kind of throw in there. All right, any questions or comments? Council member Jessup, Cleve, Cleveland, none. Espinosa, none. Williams? Nope. Excellent job. Sherman? No questions. Here and Boyle? Oh, excuse me. No, oh. thank you for always putting this together and making sure that we understand that we don't just throw numbers in there to for fun. <laughs> yeah. I agree. I mean, I know we harass you a lot about some of these reports and some of this information, but it's... Um, our number one job. So thank you so much for that. Appreciate it. Thank you. I know it's a lot of work putting it together. All right. Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So Chief Trump, are you going to present my brief? Mayor, oh. yes, can I, uh, can I ask a question? I suppose. 
What, Brian, <laughs> what happens if we don't do accounting like we're supposed to do as a city? Good question. Um, it would probably be determined during uh, an audit. And the, depending on the severity of the issue, you would be issued a management report or you, I can't remember the second level, you remember? I, I mean, basically it goes, it, basically it just goes from the management level, then it goes to a finding, finding. and then you'll see some cities like in Whitman County, when I was up there, some of the smaller ones, it can get to a level of receivership even. Yeah, so really it is, um, it's the auditor's office that would uh, find you non-compliant with uh, the rules. I just assumed the city attorney had to go to jail if we did it wrong. <laughs> well, I'm sitting here thinking that, you know, Ryan and then Mike and then my head would all just start rolling. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think it's a good question because yeah, a couple of other cities really have, have made the headlines recently with with some of their things, and I and we know that you're doing a, a good job, and the audits are are proving that as well. And so, I mean, I guess along the way, if there's things that I don't know that we need to know of, like here's something that you guys should be asking about, or like I don't, you know, without making it be a three hour meeting every single time, but a actually like a where they messed up over there would be kind of interesting to find yeah. out more detail. Well, well, we did have the finding two years ago that related to the uh, ARPA money and we weren't checking whether one of the subcontractors was a um, was not barred by federal government from accepting government contract work, which at the time the rules for ARPA changed drastically over the I was going to say that wasn't on us, and, though. But we did get a finding on it, and yeah. it is published as such, and that caused us problems with uh, DOH funding the next year. Yeah. Mm. But then last year we had a clean audit, and now we're okay again. So we don't know what SAO's um, focus is on year to year. They don't look at everything. They kind of cherry pick different areas that they're going to focus on. So you just have to keep up on everything and change your procedures. And if they find something. But Council Member Sherman brings up a really good point because we've had some not so distant neighbors recently in the news with some serious budgetary problems mm -hmm. that probably should have been caught because um, it didn't just suddenly happen. You know, they were... Um, they just were not noticed by somebody. And I'm not talking about SAO. I'm talking more internal, right? Um, um, should have been picked up or something. So, um, you know, our gratitude to you for not allowing that to happen here. And, you know, for allowing us for to be able to keep a little higher level, right? Mm -hmm. And to be able to um, trust that you um, know and do your job and get the integrity of the of the department is there. So truly, thank you. Don't get shy now. <laughs> well, and I appreciate that everything's available so that if I have a question, I can dig down and figure out what's going on. So, and I don't think I've ever taken advantage of it, but I think council members are usually invited to the opening and closing meetings with the auditors if you're interested in going. Mm -hmm. Yes, they are always. Good question. And Mike? Yeah. And, and I would just say also kudos to the council for making sure like during our, the ARPA money that that went toward like one time non reoccurring expenses because one of our neighbors were a friend of mine recently took over up their city of Sunnyside. They actually used about 80% of it for reoccurring and, and now they actually have over a $4 million deficit in one year. Oh. Did you not read that? Oh right. Yeah, I, I I I always read that sort of stuff. So, but <laughs> yeah, it's in today's. At least I think it was today that I saw it. Maybe yeah. yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Any other questions, comments, compliments? Brian's willing to hear them. <laughs> 
All right. Thank you, guys. All right, Mike, are you going to share? I, I will just blast right through this here. So uh, for a three-month period uh, of the summertime, there uh, is Yard of the Month, where it's chosen by a uh, consultation of police chief, uh, special enforcement officer, and then uh, also sometimes the public as well. So uh, the June one that was chosen, and it went to Alex Raising Alma Serum at 411 Mountain view drive so that was the june year of the month the july uh year of the month uh was bob and betty joe rush and they live have lived in the community for about two years and then the uh, and then the august where did they live it didn't have their address I, no, yeah. yeah uh i uh the tree mine area the oh. off of whitman yeah uh, and then the uh, August one was 1161 Southeast Scenic View uh, Drive that year of the month. So uh, that is just a little synopsis of what was given uh, this summer. I love seeing our neighbors' smiling faces. That's so much fun to see. All right. Yeah. All right, then. Thank you, Mike, for sharing that. Okay. Any questions or comments from council members? All right, hearing none, is there any business for go to the order? All right, I don't hear none. So, sorry that you didn't yes. hear any because I was on mute and I was <laughs> <laughs> um, I would just ask that the city clerk, if you could email, scan and email the handout that was handed out to those of us who were here electronically, I would appreciate it. Yeah, she's so noted. Okay, we'll get that done. All right, anything else? All right, then, then I will conclude the workshop at 7.01. It would have been seven had Council Member Williams not had, had a... No. <laughs> so, it would have been a lot earlier. Yeah, sort of. okay, if I didn't compliment so much. All right, we now conclude the workshop at 7.02 p.m. Thanks, everybody. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye-bye.